What a joy to be able to celebrate this Eucharist with you and with all of our friends and brothers and sisters watching on Catholic television. Today is Christmas, Christ's Mass, and in this Eucharist we rejoice to recall his birthday and to give thanks for the greatest gift of all, which is the gift of Jesus Christ. Recently there was a Pew study. They take up surveys on a number of issues, particularly around religion. And in the study it indicated that 90% of Americans celebrate Christmas. But only about half of those celebrate it as a religious feast. That's not really surprising. It's almost a cliche to say that Christmas has turned into a commercial enterprise steeped in sentimentality and resulting in credit card debt and dyspepsia. But the first Christmas was celebrated only by a handful of people. It was invitation only, very exclusive. A carpenter and his pregnant wife were invited by the Roman emperor to go to Bethlehem so that he would be able to enroll them to pay their taxes. We're talking a lot about taxes these days. A handful of shepherds were invited by the angels, and three eccentric astronomers were beguiled by a star that invited them to Bethlehem. When Mary and Joseph arrived at the village of Joseph's ancestors, is where they had to go and enroll for the census and the taxes, it was the town of David. They frantically sought lodging because Mary was very pregnant. They were bitterly disappointed that they were denied lodging at the local Holiday Inn. There was room for the rich, for those clothed in soft garments, but the saddest words in the gospel are, there was no room in the inn. No room in the inn. But there was room in the garage, in the stable. The inn was the chic place to be. It was the gathering place of public opinion, the focal point of the world's moods, the rendezvous of the worldly, the rallying place of the popular, the successful, and the well-heeled. The stable is the place for outcasts, the ignored, the invisible ones, the forgotten ones. The world expected that the Messiah was going to come with the gong show and be born in the inn, at least, if not in a palace. The stable would be the last place that anyone would look for the Messiah. The lesson is, God is often to be found where we least expect it. So the Son of God, made man, is invited into his own world, and he comes through the back door. The great virtue of Christmas is hospitality, making room for God in our hearts and in our lives. Today we want to ask God for that vision of faith so that we can discover God in all of the unexpected places and practice hospitality and openness to the ignored and the forgotten. Changing history by making room in the inn. As Isaiah proclaims, a child is born for us, a son is given, upon his shoulder dominion rests. They name him Wonder Counselor, God Hero, Father Forever, Prince of Peace. One of the central themes of Christmas has always been peace. In 2005, an epic war drama based on a Christmas truce in World War I 
came out. It was called Joyeux Noël. World War I was one of the deadliest conflicts in the history of the world. 30 million people were killed. The film depicts an actual event that took place in December of 1914. Wilhelm, the son of the Kaiser, the crown prince, sent the leading sin singer, a tenor, from the Berlin Opera to sing at the front lines. He sang Stille Nacht, Silent Night. And when he began to sing, the French soldiers stood up in their trenches and they applauded. And then the British troops began to accompany him with their bagpipes. And suddenly, the officers from the three armies met in the no man's land and agreed on a ceasefire. They shared a midnight mass, a soccer match, food and drink and caroling. Later on, they were all reprimanded and punished for participating in that Christmas truce. But it's a wonderful story, a true story, that reminds us that Christ is the Prince of Peace. And his birth draws us closer to God and closer to each other. It calls us to forgive, to love, to care for one another, to share the joy of the closeness of our God. When I was in the seminary, our provincial, Father Claude, wrote to Rome and said, we want a new mission for the friars. Make it the most difficult mission in the world. Well, one week later, we got a letter back saying, send the friars to Papua New Guinea. And so a group of friars went. They were assigned to the southern highlands. They arrived there in a small paper, uh, Piper Cub plane. And the natives, who had never seen Europeans, never seen a plane, most of them, came out of the bush, and through an interpreter, they wanted to know whether the plane was a male or a female. They said, if it's a female, we want an egg. <laughs> well, the natives were living in constant warfare. There were tribal warfares going all on all the time. They were practicing cannibalism. They didn't have any scientific understanding of the causes of death. So every time that someone died in a village, it was presumed that an enemy had caused it by poisoning them or by putting a curse or a spell on them, and immediately a war would break out, a vendetta. It was very difficult for the friars to begin to evangelize there. But little by little, the natives came to cherish the light of the gospel that brought peace to their lives and liberated them from so much darkness. It was helpful when the friars discovered certain traditions and legends and practices of the people that had an application from the point of view of the gospel. One custom that the friars often used in explaining the coming of Christ at Christmas and how his birth brought peace and goodness into a world was the ancient custom that the people had in Papua New Guinea that when war was going on between two tribes, the way that they ended it, would one tribe would take a baby and give it to the other tribe. And that tribe would then raise that child as their own. And so the war would stop. And as long as that child were alive and were being cared for by the other tribe, there would be no fighting. But if the child died, then the war would resume. The missionaries used this story to help the natives understand the significance of Christmas. Humanity was estranged from God at war because of sin. God gives his son to be one of us, to be part of our tribe, 
to establish peace between heaven and earth. And this peace will last forever because Christ has conquered sin and death and lives forever in the resurrection. Christ is the Prince of Peace. He's come to bring peace, to teach us how to restore broken relationships, to start over, to let the light of God's love into the darkest corners of our hearts. Our personal peace can be achieved only by trusting in God and by our own personal conversion. God is always calling us home, waiting patiently and lovingly. The light is in the window and the hearth is burning to warm us. Peace comes through reconciliation and forgiveness. The experience of mercy, both giving mercy and receiving mercy. The peace in knowing that we are not orphans, that we are God's beloved sons and daughters. And by being connected to God, we are connected to one another as brothers and sisters. We are brothers and sisters, but not twins. In Christ's family, we come in all sizes, shapes, and colors, speaking every language imaginable. And as in any family, there has to be a special regard for those who are most in need. When a family has a child that cannot walk or that has some other problem, the parents take into consideration the needs of that child, and they give that child even more attention and love. This is the logic of love. The same should be true in our larger family, the church, society in general, and the community of nations. I felt so moved by the example of Pope Francis who, during one of his Wednesday audiences, got down from the Pope meal, waded his way through the crowd to a man who was, had hideously deformation in his face and his head, and he was covered with these terrible boils. Pope Francis embraced him and kissed him. His name was Vincenzo Riva. Afterwards, the reporters went up to him and asked the man about the experience. He said he was so moved by the Pope. He said, usually strangers would never look at him let alone speak with him or touch him. He said, when I would get on a bus, people would move uh, to be far away from me. But for Pope Francis is always talking about vicinanza, closeness. At Christmas, God draws close to us and then draws us closer to each other. The first Christmas carol was sung by the angels. Today we have the sisters here singing Christmas carols. It's like having the angels. <laughs> the song that they sang proclaimed glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. The Prince of Peace is coming. He comes in the face of a little child because God wants us to see that his love is always new, always fresh, never tired of loving us, never tired of forgiving us, never tired of giving us another chance, even when we've given up on ourselves. He is born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, it means house of bread. And he's laid in a manger which was the feed box, because Christ has become the manna, the bread come down from heaven, come to feed and to nourish us. He comes in the community of faith where two or three are gathered in his name. He comes in the distressing disguise of the poor, the homeless, the sick, the prisoner. The world is distracted by all the noise and many of the symbols of Christmas that have become devoid of meaning. But someone is opening the back door. 
He's with us. He's in the house. Let us give thanks and rejoice. Come, let us adore the Prince of Peace. Merry Christmas. <laughs>